Well, good morning. So good to be with y'all every week. If you'll open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, we'll be in chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. If you're new and you're using our chair Bibles, our text this morning will be on page 857. And I want to begin by asking you three separate but related questions. First, when God turns the world upside down and 3,000 people are saved and baptized, what happens to those people? Second, when God saves people, what should they do? Maybe you're a new Christian, what should you do? Third, if God were to grant revival in our day and we were to see mass conversion, what should we do? We'll answer those as we go. But to begin, it'll be helpful before we dive into our text to zoom out and make sure we get the big picture of Acts. What is God doing in the book of Acts? What is he doing? Well, in Acts, God is forming a spirit-filled church on mission as witnesses to the risen and reigning king, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the ends of the earth. That's what he's doing. He's forming a spirit-filled church on mission as witnesses to the risen and reigning king, the Lord Jesus Christ, unto the ends of the earth. The question this morning is, how will that mission be sustained? How is it going to last? And this morning, as we begin to see God make good on his word in the book of Acts, to pour out his spirit and to save, I want you to see that devotion sustains mission. Devotion sustains mission. That's the main point of our text, and that's going to be the main point of our time together this morning. So let's read Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Devotion sustains mission. We see the church's devotion in verse 42, and then that same word is actually used by Luke in verse 46. It's just not as, you can't see it in English. But what what the, the Bible translators translate as, and day by day attending the temple together, it's the same word that's used. They were devoting themselves day by day to the temple together. So devotion is the thread that ties this whole passage together. So so to start, we need to ask, well, what is devotion? We've got to make sure we're on the same page. Devotion is holding fast to something. It's being relentless in your commitment to something regardless of the cost. It's a mother giving of mind, body, and soul to nourish and cherish their child. It's a husband in sickness loving his wife to the end. It's a dog chasing their tail until they get it. It's an athlete, rain or shine, who's up at at 5 a.m. for workouts when all of their friends are asleep. That's devotion, and devotion is what sustains mission, but devotion by itself isn't enough. Devotion must be oriented or directed to the right end, towards the right goal. Devotion must be aimed at the correct Object. And this morning we'll see that the kind of devotion that sustains the church's mission is devotion to the things of God and devotion to the people of God. Devotion to the things of God and devotion to the people of God. So let's look at the church's devotion to the things of God. Look at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We'll see five things that the church devotes themselves to. This is the first. The apostles' teaching. These men and women who have been saved, they've been baptized, they've been given the Spirit. 
And what does the Spirit of God do in them? Well, the Spirit of God creates a teachable people. People who are hungry to know the living God and to know what it means to follow him. So what was the content of the apostles' teaching? Well, we got a taste last week, and we'll get plenty more as we work through the book of Acts. But at its core, the apostles' teaching is that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified for our sins, resurrected in power, and exalted to the right hand of the Father, that you might know that he is both Lord and Christ. He is the eternal son who is the present king whose reign is in session right now and will have no end. And this God has sent messengers, human messengers, to proclaim the good news and command you to repent, to turn from your sin and to turn to Christ, to put down your agenda and to take up his. If you don't know Jesus as Lord, as king of all, including your life, you need to know that the tomb is empty. Death has been emptied of his power, and the one who emptied it sits at the right hand of God. He's going to come to judge the world in power, and he commands you to come to him. He desires that you would live all of your life for him, because your life is not your own. Your life has been bought with a price, and the sum whole of your life is to live for his renown, for his praise, for him to be known, loved, and obeyed in all the world. That's the core of the gospel. That's the core of the apostles' teaching. But note, if they're devoting themselves to the teaching day by day, the gospel isn't just a one-time message of conversion that once you know, once you walk the aisle, once you pray a prayer, once you've been baptized, you're all good, you've got your get out of hell free card and you're good to go back to your life. That would make no sense. No, those who believed devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So when God saves someone and fills them with his spirit, that person is a lifelong learner who wants to sit at God's feet, at the center of your schedule, at the center of your family rhythms ought to be a commitment to the word of God. And this is even more amazing when we know what else is going on at this time. Look at verse 43. And awe or fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. At this time, the miraculous was par for the course. It was an everyday happening. Flip with me to Acts chapter 5. I want you to get a flavor for the extent of the miraculous. Look at verse 12 of Acts chapter 5. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together, Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Note that. In our text, it'll be the Lord adds to his people. Here it's they were added to the Lord because God and his people are inseparable. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Friends, amazing things were happening. Everybody was getting healed. You had people bringing the sick, laying them on the streets so that Peter, Peter in his shadow might just fall upon their face and they would be healed by his shadow. The lame are going to walk. The possessed by demons will be freed. The dead will even rise in the book of Acts. And in the midst of all of this, what are God's people devoting themselves to? The teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. You ought to see that the content of the apostles' ministry is the same as that of Jesus. Teaching and miracles. Teaching and miracles. Teaching and miracles. But what takes precedent? The teaching. The miracles serve the teaching. I mean, what did we see Peter do after everybody started talking in tongues so that people thought everyone was drunk at 9 a.m. in the morning? He proclaims the gospel. He opens up the word and says, this is according to God's plan. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ. 
When the apostles heal throughout Acts, what do they do after people say, how do you do this? They preach Jesus Christ and him crucified and say it's only in his name that any of this is happening. The spirit-filled people of God are a people of the book, even amidst the miraculous. There are sectors of the church today that want to privilege the spirit at the expense of the spirit's book, but the Bible just leaves no room for that. To be spirit-filled is not to find the word periphery, but central. It's not an add-on, it's the main course. It's not unnecessary, but it's more necessary than you ever thought or dreamed. Why? Because in the apostles' teaching, we find Jesus. And Jesus is our very life. He's our daily bread. He is our hope, our righteousness, our wisdom, our sanctification. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So we must continue to devote ourselves to the teaching, privately and corporately. And this is why we preach and teach the Bible expositionally. We just want you to know what God has said. We want you to understand it, see how Christ is at the center of it all, and apply it to your life. It's why every time we gather, whether it's in big groups or small groups, the expectation is that the word of God is taught. It's opened. Because the word is what equips us for every good work, and it's what reveals to us Jesus, the only name under heaven by which we will be saved. So the first thing that the church devotes themselves to is the apostles' teaching. The second is the prayers. Second is the prayers. Look back at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. See, God's people are not just devoted to the word of God. They're also devoted to prayer. They commit themselves to it and they don't give up. And Luke, the author of Acts, is emphatic on this point. The thread of God's people praying is central to the unfolding work of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts. Every time there's a big move of God, there's prayer warriors behind it. Flip back to Acts chapter 1. I want you to see this. Because I think Luke wants you to see this. Chapter 1, verse 14. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers and sisters. So Jesus had ascended, but they did not yet have the spirit, and they were devoting themselves to prayer with one accord. Note that. This isn't just personal prayer, although that's certainly assumed and is taught elsewhere in the scriptures, but this is corporate prayer. They were praying with one accord together, just as Jesus taught them. So we miss this in our hyper-individualistic culture. But this has always been how Jesus wants his followers to pray. I mean, have you ever thought about what you're praying when you pray the Lord's Prayer? Is that a personal prayer or a corporate prayer? Well, the answer is yes, but it's primarily a corporate prayer. Think of the pronouns. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. To pray the Lord's Prayer is to pray it with people or to pray it with your covenant community in your mind. It demands a body. It demands a people whom you're walking shoulder to shoulder with as the gospel advances to the ends of the earth. In Acts chapter 12, we won't turn there, but Peter's going to get locked up for preaching the gospel. It looks really bad. King Herod had already killed James, the brother of John, with a sword, and he was thirsty for more, and it looked like Peter was up next. But you know what Luke makes sure to record for his readers? Acts 12, 5 says this, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. That same night, two verses later, the angels pull off a prison break. Coincidence? I think not. Luke, time after time, records the devotion of the church to corporate prayer, yes, as a matter of historical fact, but also as a note of exhortation for future followers, that the sovereign God of the universe uses means. God's kingdom advances through spirit-filled men and women who proclaim the gospel and devote themselves to it. God's kingdom advances through spirit-filled men and women who devote themselves to prayer together. Both require faith. Both can seem foolish. Both can seem like an utter waste of time. But this is how God is pleased to grow his church. 
so that he might get all the glory and so that his people might know the wonderful generosity of their God who invites them in as partners in his redemptive mission. I mean, God uses you and I, friends. Your prayers are not meaningless. They're some of the means by which God is gonna save and sanctify his people. So church, beloved, we must continue to pray together as a body. If the early church is a litmus test and we compare ourselves to it, we have room to grow in our devotion to corporate prayer. So what would growth look like? Well, it would look like this room being full for our evening services just like it is this morning. Every first and third Sunday, our evening services are the main place where with one accord we devote ourselves to prayer. That's when we pray together most. So prioritize it, plan for it, and sacrifice for it. I know it's easier to sit on the couch and to watch some NFL football. I know it's easy to doubt whether prayer even does anything and to doubt whether or not your presence or absence would make any difference at all. I get that prayer can be hard. I don't stand before you as a man who has an A-plus on my prayer report card. But I stand before you as a man under God's word, which says plain as day that you and I together as a church must be devoted to prayer. I don't know about you, but I want to see God do amazing things in and through this body. I want to see revival come to Abilene. I want to see dying churches have the breath of life breathed back into them. I want churches to be planted and watered to maturity. I want to see sinners saved and saints sanctified. I want to see the sick healed, the mourning comforted. I want to see broken relationships restored. I want to see the next generation heralding the gospel with boldness and clarity and joy. You know what I don't want? I don't want us to get to the end of our lives and wonder, what might we have seen if we had just persevered in prayer? What did we miss out on? Because we were faithless to do what God has called us to do, which is pray together. It's hard because it takes faith, but it's my prayer that as we see time and time again in Acts, the church's devotion to prayer, that we might be like them. We might be like Jesus. So we've seen how the church is devoted to the things of God, to the word and to prayer. Now we'll see how the church is devoted to the people of God. Go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. The fellowship, what does this mean? It's explained in verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. The word translated common is the same word that's translated fellowship. So this is explaining what it means to be devoted to the fellowship. And it continues in 45. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So what does it mean to be devoted to the fellowship? It means to be devoted to sacrificial generosity for the sake of your fellow believers. It means to be devoted to sacrificial generosity for the good of your fellow believers. It means you're going to have to open up your wallet sometimes. It means you have to pull out your checkbook. It means you have to forsake things you have every right to have that you might freely give them away for others' sake. Now, this devotion is characterized by voluntary generosity to the meeting of occasional needs. This devotion is characterized by voluntary generosity to the meeting of occasional needs. This doesn't teach socialism or the removal of private property like some people want it to teach. It teaches that Christians imitate their Lord Jesus who freely gave his life so that others might find theirs. It teaches that those who claim Christ's name imitate Christ's example, even with their money. It looks like having Christ's mindset. What was his mindset from Philippians? He considered others more significant than himself. Therefore, I'll consider you more significant than myself. And I'll show you not just in word, but in deed. You need some money for your medical bills? Let me go and sell some of my extra acreage, and I got you. You need a place to stay for two months? Take my back house free of charge. You can't pay your rent, I'll cover it for you. Friends, this was what marked the early church. It it is what ought to mark us more. And praise God, this already does. Church, y'all are a generous church. 
and it's wonderful to be a part of. And being on staff is such a privilege because I get to hear the generosity that y'all might not normally get to hear about. And my own family has been personally blessed. When my family couldn't afford a house and we needed some help, Eric and Jennifer Morris put us up in their back house until the Lord provided. When students need money for the summer practicum, the church rises up every time. When we send people to the field, the church rises up every time. When members are financially strained, our deacons do a wonderful job of working through their benevolence policy funded by the church members to meet those needs. So friends, keep going. Don't stop and just ramp it up. And make sure you're prioritizing the needs of the people of this body instead of your own American dream. We all need less than we think. And eternity is real, friends. So store up your treasures there and be free with your treasures here. Now, one thing this might mean in our context is some of y'all learning to ask for help. We must learn to admit our needs. God does not help those who help themselves. He helps those who are humble enough to admit their need for him. And then he steps in. And he steps in a lot of times through his people. Jesus said we have not because we ask not. So may we learn to ask. And then when people ask, may we learn to meet their needs over and above what they could ever ask for. Next we'll see that God's people devote themselves to the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. Look again at 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayer. What is this? It's table hospitality. Once again, this is illustrated in 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So God's people are meant to eat their spiritual food together and their physical food together. This is really simple to understand, but it's just harder to live and consistently apply. What, what might this mean for you? It means your home should be a revolving door. Your dinner, should, your dinner table should regularly be filled with your fellow church members. It doesn't have to be fancy. Your house does not have to be perfectly clean and swept and, and put a bunch of fancy fragrances. We don't need all of the red carpet rolled out. It doesn't have to be a three-course meal. Just start somewhere. Maybe it's once a month you commit to having a church family over. Maybe it's once a week. Whatever the frequency, commit to it, plan for it, and do it. Make some crock pot tacos, grill some burgers, throw some frozen pizza in the oven, thank God for the food, get to know them, talk about Jesus, and see what the Lord does. This is the meat and potatoes of the Christian life, pun intended. <laughs> and college students, you're not excluded from this. You have an opportunity to share the gospel with your house or hallmates. You want to get that opportunity? Have some people from the church who should never be in a college dorm room over, feed them some pizza, maybe buy some carrots, make it healthy, give them some water, leave the dorm room open, and I guarantee you that someone the next couple of days, they're just going to look, oh, your door's open? Hey, bro, who are those people here? Is that your family? Ah, uh, yes and no. They're not my blood family. Well, I guess they kind of are because the blood of Jesus saved us together and we follow Jesus together. What are you talking about? Well, let me tell you about it. I'm part of a local church, which is a bunch of weak people who've been saved by a strong God. My hope is in Jesus Christ alone. You want to have these opportunities, live normal, frequent, radically generous and hospitable lives and be ready with the gospel. Just like the miracles serve the teaching, so acts of love often lead us to get to share the gospel. Now, full disclosure, church, at some point this will be burdensome. Not to mention it might be expensive. We've got some big families in this church. And I can just tell you, it's going to happen that on one of those days you're planning on having people over, you'll be tired, maybe you'll have a terrible day at work, maybe your kids were absolutely wild that day, maybe you got in an argument with your spouse Sin happened, you feel icky, and you'll be tempted to call it off because you're not at your best, you're struggling, you don't really have anything great to give them. Ask me how I know. But that's when it's important to press in. I'm not saying you can't ever cancel. I'm saying we have to get rid of the mirage of perfection, the mirage that we have it all together at all times, and commit to doing life together even when we're barely hanging on. Because that's when gospel community is formed. 
In our weakness, God loves to show himself strong. That's when the word of Christ will be your comfort that you needed. You didn't need to be alone. You needed to be together. You needed someone else who's having a good day to come over and say, I got just the word for you. I was in the word this morning. And God saves sinners like you and me. You're going to be all right. You're going to make it. And why is it that God has designed us to break bread together? Well, I think there's just something sacred, something vulnerable at opening up your home. There's an intimacy there. To open up your front door and to seat them at your table is to open up your life and give them a front row seat to your heart, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's to allow someone in, but that's where a bond forms as you partake of food that literally sustains your life. Because if you don't eat, you're going to die. doesn't matter your skin color, economic class, heritage, culture, everybody has to eat to live. And when we sit across from someone and serve them food, the walls come down, the hearts open up, and life is shared. Friendship is formed, and the gospel advances. So friends, open up your home to your fellow Christians. It's part of what it means to be devoted to Jesus Christ. And lastly, I want you to see the withness of the church. Withness, W-I-T-H-N-E-S-S, and yes, it is a word I looked it up. Look at verses 44 and 46. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 46, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes... They received their food with glad and generous hearts. There was a witness, a camaraderie among Christians. This is so simple and obvious that we can miss it. They were just together. They were a squad. They were a crew in private and in public, in each other's homes and in God's house. They were attending the temple together, which reminds us that in Acts, everything's changing, but not everything changes immediately. Why were they going to the temple? Likely it was for the regular times of prayer, which were three times a day, or it was because it was the place where the apostles were doing the most of their teaching. This is where we have to be careful to understand this text in its context and then apply it rightly to ours. So we don't need to go to the temple together. It's part of the old covenant age. But we ought to be together in our homes and here as the church gathers on Sundays and Wednesdays because we, the gathered people of God, are the temple as we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We must be with one another. It's simple, so schedule it. Fold in friends to your normal rhythms and just do life together. And when it's done faithfully and frequently, withness often leads to witness. What might withness leading to witness looks like? It looks like an unbelieving hospital nurse being confused by how many non-family members are visiting someone from our body who's sick in the hospital. And then that's a lob that you can share the gospel He's in need. I know someone who met me in my need, therefore I'm here to meet him in his need. It looks like a conversation I had with my neighbor who asked me, so what happens on Thursday nights at your house? (laughs) And I tell him, well, 20 to 25 college students come over to sing, study the word, pray together, and just be together because we don't follow Jesus fully. And then we start talking about Jesus, church, and now I know they haven't been in church in years. And maybe I can make plans to have them over, talk about that more, and invite them and share the gospel. Withness leads to witness. So church, let's grow in our commitment to one another so that the world might know the love of God in real time. So we've seen that God's people are devoted to the things of God, the word and the prayer, and to the people of God. Now I want to zoom out and make sure that we connect the activities of the early church to what we do here as a body. See, texts like these are part of why we do church membership. Now, that can be a weird concept in our day, but this is why, these, are text, these texts are why we do church membership. Because if we're bound to do everything that I just told you to do to all people, all over the world, all over the city, we don't have what it takes. So it's helpful to remind ourselves who Luke is talking about here. He's talking about those who believed as a result of Peter's Pentecost sermon. It's a distinct group in a distinct place. And we'll see in verse 47 that people were added to their number, which assumes an identifiable group of people. In other words, this is the Jerusalem church. First Baptist Jerusalem. But if we go back to those first three questions I asked this morning, we'll see that the questions are actually quite simple, or the answers. 
When God turns the world upside down and 3,000 people are saved and baptized, what happens to those people? They form a church, worship, and do life together. Second, when God saves people, what should they do? Get baptized into a local church. Be added to God's people where you live. Third, if God were to grant revival in our day and we saw mass conversion, what should we do with these believers? baptize them into the local church and say, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Devote yourself to the word. Devote yourself to corporate prayer. Devote yourself to eating with fellow Christians. Devote yourself to meeting their needs, whatever they might be, and devote yourself to being with them. And this happens best in local churches. Because church membership binds us together in committed love. And and it provides the target, so to speak, where we can aim our love where you can aim your obedience. Who ought you to be generous with? Who ought you to eat with? Who ought you to pray with? Not exclusively, but predominantly. Jonathan Lehman uses the example of a basketball team. You often hear it say, the church is the people, not the place. And that's true. It's true that a church remains a church even when it's not gathered, just like a basketball team is a team even when the members aren't gathered to play basketball. And yet still, A church becomes a church by gathering in a place. And we can only become members by gathering with it. You can't be a church member without gathering, just like you can't be on the basketball team if you never show up to the games. So church membership is crucial. To be a Christian is to be with other believers in a local church where there is mutual commitment among members who make promises to one another to walk together in Christian love under the oversight and protection of elders who teach and lead, served by deacons who are the lead servants, giving to meeting practical needs and preserving unity. Jesus said this, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus ties his name to our love. That's stunning. Jesus ties his name to our love. This is his design. And when the church is faithful to devote themselves to the things of God and to the people of God, the church grows. Look at verse 47. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The Lord... That is, Jesus Christ, the ascended king, continues to add people to his church. It is his work. And it should be our confident expectation that as we are faithful to devote ourselves to God and his people, he will grow our number. This is his plan. He's forming a spirit-filled church on mission as witnesses to the risen and reigning king, the Lord Jesus Christ, unto the ends of the earth that is sustained by devotion. That's what the church did. It's the content of their action. But briefly, I want to do two more things, then I'm going to sit down. I want you to note the aroma of the church's devotion, and I want to remind you that this devotion is only possible by the gospel through the Spirit. Because there's a massive danger here. It's a massive pothole we must watch out for. Because we can do everything right. We can check the boxes. We can order our church and lives rightly. And yet we can burn out, we can be bland, it can be all external. But I want you to see the aroma of the early church. I want you to see not just what they did, but how they did it, how it came off. So look again at verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. These people knew the fear of God. They knew what it meant to be amazed to have their jaws drop in amazement at God's sovereign power. They knew what it was to be head down, tears flowing, amazed that God shows mercy to sinners like you and me by nailing his son to the tree. They knew what it was to worship a God who was entirely other than them, so majestic, so power, so wonderful that he can do as he pleases. They knew the fear of God. They were also generous in heart and in action. Look back at verse 45 with me. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, 
See, generosity, yes, is action, but it should flow from a right heart posture, that you want to be generous. It's your joy to meet the needs of God's people. They're happy to give because they've been given everything in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This church was also humble. They were humble. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Every time they ate, they received their food for what it was, a gift from God that they didn't deserve. Kids, this is why your parents pray before every meal. Because it comes from a place of unending gratitude that every time there's food on your table, it's an answered prayer that God has given your family daily bread. They knew they were nothing and yet God gave them everything. Even the ability to work is a gift so that you can earn your keep. It's all grace, friends. What do we have that we have not received? These people were happy. Look at 46 one more time. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. And that word for glad is a strong word. It means to exult, to be exuberant. It means there ought to be days, fathers, mothers, friends, where your prayer before a meal is matched with a smile. There's a radiance. This is not just a perfunctory prayer. This is my heart's delight that God is good. He's been good to me and he will continue to be. And lastly, they were favored. Yes, they were going to be persecuted, but that doesn't mean that as a Christian you're always needing to be disliked. Yes, the persecution might come, but you can be a Christian and bless your neighborhood, your school, and your workplace. You can be a Christian whom people love to be around because you're content, you're grateful, you're industrious. In fact, that ought to be the norm. These things ought to go together. And I just love the balance here. I love the balance. I love that this attests to the whole range of Christian experience. Because too often in churches, we're given a false dichotomy. You can either fear God and understand your sin and his holiness, or you can be happy and kind of contri- and trite, and everything's light. It's either one or the other, but we want both, friends. That's how it ought to be. May we know the fear of the Lord that sobers us up and causes us to walk wisely as we live all of our lives before the judgment seat of Christ. Knowing that apart from God's grace and mercy, we ought to be dead. We do deserve eternal damnation. But we should also know the unfathomable kindness of God that makes us a happy and joyful people. Which leads to a people marked by praise. We ought to praise, friends, because all of your sins are forgiven. The creator of the universe who has every right to judge you and pay you back for your sin has sent his son to bear the penalty that you might be a child of God who only knows his favor and love. The one who hung the stars loves you. The one who spoke and the water sprang forth and spoke and he says, that one's mine. That one's forgiven. That one's loved. That one's chosen. Southside, may we know the fear of God and the love of God. May our lives be marked by praise and may we be a people devoted to the things of God and the people of God. And this only is possible with the gospel, with the spirit inside of us. And nothing else explains the devotion of the church other than the love of God for his people as displayed in Jesus Christ, crucified, resurrected, and exalted. Unto death he gave himself for you. Therefore, unto death we can give ourselves for other people.